So um, Gustav has um, an engineering background and he previously worked in the medtech industry as a research engineer, where he developed tools for stroke diagnosis uh, using microwave technology. But now he's doing his PhD and, um, and he's mainly working with machine learning techniques. And he will present today one of his PhD work, which uh, consists in the automatic visual rating of medial temporal atrophy based on machine learning techniques. And um, he's going to defend his um, uh, thesis very soon in May. So feel free to ask uh, any tough questions. So it will be like a good uh, practice for him. <laughs> yeah. So, good stuff. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, I'll see if I can just share screen. I haven't used Zoom before. Can, uh, can you hear me? It's in the bottom. Uh, there's a little icon called share. Yeah, exactly. All right. But you can hear me good? Yeah, very well. OK, perfect. OK, so again, thank you for, for having me. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll talk about the, sorry. All right. OK, so I'll talk about, the, well, two of my main projects, essentially, in my, in my PhD, where the first one is a deep learning project that we called what we call it AVRA, which is an acronym for the model and for the network architecture itself, but uh, it's for automatic visual ratings of atrophy um, from MRI images using recurrent convolutional neural networks. And then the second study is sort of a follow-up to that because we wanted to assess, well, how well does this perform when we look at external clinical data? So essentially looking into the domain shift within deep learning and medical imaging in particular. Uh, so the first part would be to sort of go through the visual rating scales. Uh, and I'm not sure how familiar you are with them, but this is still the way to quantify atrophy in the clinics. So they don't use softwares as we do in research, but they actually visually assess an image and then give it a score from zero to four or zero to three, depending on how much atrophy in a specific, specific region uh, there are. Uh, and they do this based on established visual rating scales. So in dementia and Alzheimer's disease, then Shelton scale of medial temporal atrophy or the MTA scale is probably the most commonly used uh, in clinics. And it assesses hippocampus and its surrounding structures. So if you can see the, the red boxes here, uh, that's namely the ones, uh, and it ranges from zero to four in discrete steps, but it's an ordinal scale where zero is no atrophy and four is severe or end stage atrophy. Uh, the MTA scale is assessed in a single slice, just anterior of the pons, uh, because it was developed in the nineties where, well, you wouldn't have access to 3D protocols in general. So, uh, but it, it works very well and can, it's a pretty good diagnostic biomarker for, for, for many dementias. Uh, another commonly one used scale is the GCA scale or the global cortical atrophy uh, where there are different subscales and we've mainly been looking at the frontal subscale uh, where you look at cortical atrophy and in our case then in the frontal in the frontal lobe so this ranges from zero to three where zero is no atrophy and three is end stage or knife blade atrophy uh, different to the MTA scale the GCA scale you, the radiologist assesses several slices, so several axial slices. So they would start from the bottom, go up, and then remember what they've seen, and then give a composite score based on that. The last scale is the PA scale, which looks at regional atrophy in the parietal lobe or posterior atrophy. Uh, and again, it goes from zero to, zero to three, and this is an important scale for so early onset uh, Alzheimer's disease, it's common to have uh, a large or an abnormal PA value. Uh, and again, we're looking at multiple slices, but this time we're doing it in all three anatomical planes. So these are the three scales that we were interested in trying to predict automatically with deep learning. And uh, as you can see, there are, they are very similar, but they're also a bit different. So um, introducing some engineering challenges. But anyway, these scales are very, very subjective. So two radiologists that rates the same image might not necessarily give it the same score. In fact, it's actually not that great. 
typically if you were if you were to take two radi radiologists at different places that haven't seen each other or trained together then their rating agreement would probably be pretty poor uh, it's also time consuming it might be okay for a clinical setting it's in the range of minutes but for research where we would have thousands of images it would be very very tedious and take a long time and it would also require a highly experienced radiologist to get reliable ratings so preferably someone who does ratings on a daily basis because it's been shown to improve reliability so our aim in this project was to develop an automatic tool for this uh, that should be fast it should be consistent or reliable and of course it should have good agreement with the radiologist and we put some additional requirements on this task or how we de develop this model because we want Avra, I mean, not necessarily Avra, but when developing a tool like this, we are interested in seeing that it could potentially work in a clinical setting. So there shouldn't be any methodological issues that would prevent it from that. But one of those, we wanted to have a similar network architecture for all three scales. So not necessarily exactly the same, but, we, but because they're kind of similar, it made sense to have a similar network architecture. We didn't want to include substantial pre-processing uh, because again, a lot of these steps tends to fail, which is also probably the reason why we don't have automatic softwares in the clinics today, because, well, most of them are not reliable enough or fail in some cases. So whenever you add a step of pre-processing, this is a potential step that, that may fail. And the, the beauty with visual ratings is that you can read um, these images even if it's very poor quality or very great slice thickness, it should still work. And ideally it should work on a large range of scanning protocols with varying imaging qualities. And this is really what we're looking into in the second study that I'll be presenting. And if anyone has any questions, by the way, feel free to ask. Uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, what you're most interested in, but if you have any technical or implementation questions that you're curious about, just just go ahead and ask. All right, so the way to approach this in a traditional sense, because we come from a neuroimaging lab where we use FreeSurfer a lot in SPM. So the traditional way to approach this would be, well, to do FreeSurfer essentially, which segments the brain into gray and white matter, and then to regions of interest according to a neuroanatomical atlas. And from that, we compute volume, so thickness measures from these roys. And then we can apply a pretty simple model to train that to predict visual rating scores. But there are some issues with that. As I said before, the segmentation is a step that's prone to fail. So I recently looked did QC on just hippocampus in a very good research cohort, but still we had to discard 10% of the cases because the segmentation was bad. Uh, and this is of course an issue if you wanna apply something into the clinics. And furthermore, when doing like reducing all this information into a volume of the hippocampus, for instance, you lose a lot of sh information regarding the shape, which is probably very important in the MTA scale where volume might not be the best uh, indicator of the MTA score. And, of sorry. All right. Um, and furthermore, it requires a 3D protocol because all of these software tools are typically developed for MRI. So it will never work on CT and CT would be the, the modality that would have most clinical benefits because at least in Sweden, I think more than 70% of all scans are done with CT still in, in, in dementia or in geriatrics. Um, but yeah, deep learning is a good way to overcome a lot of these issues uh, and maybe particularly then recurrent convolutional neural networks. So this is the model design that we settled on. And I should say that we tried quite a lot of different versions. Uh, and this is the one that we ended up on that worked for all three rating scales very well, or quite well at least. Uh, so it's a combination where we fused a convolutional neural network, namely the residual attention network. Uh, and this kind of network is, a, well, it's a rest net, but it has attention modules. So it will focus on local structures in the image, which seems suitable for this kind of task. Uh, so the, this residual attention net extract features from each slice individually. 
which is then forward to an LSTM network. And the idea here is that these LSTM modules should keep in the memory whatever is important for this rating scale. And then once we propagate through all the slices, <clears throat> it can update its memory and then we pass that to uh, just a fully connected network that will then give us our predictions. Uh, so this is essentially how a radiologist would process an image. You would go through them slice by slice, you will remember what you've seen, and then you'll make a prediction based on that. Uh, but it's good because it's quite kind of flexible. We can vary the slice thickness, and it's just, it still works. And this sort of architecture will also be suitable for CT where slice thickness will in fact vary, and very often be, well, three millimeters at least, or two millimeters, but um, worse resolution than in MRI for sure. And as I said, we tried more common like ResNets and even small DGGs produced a very good results on the MTA scale, for instance, but it would not work across all three, all three scales. So the data we had for this came mainly from the, well, ADNI. I guess you are familiar with that, but it's a very big and very good public uh, research cohort from North America. Uh, so 1,900 images from that, and then we had 400 images from our own memory clinic at, uh, in Stockholm. Uh, and they were all rated but for these three rating scales by a single, well, ex very experienced radiologist. And we then further applied data augmentation, some mirroring, scaling, some bias field correction, and random cropping to simulate the larger data set. And during model development, we use five-fold cross-validation. And the idea was, well, to find hyperparameter or tune hyperparameters and also the model development architecture. And then in the end, we evaluated a model that we were comfortable with on this holdout test set. Uh, so typical way to assess rating reliability in in these studies using visual ratings are with Cohen's kappa, Cohen's weighted kappa. And it's a measure rating from uh, ranging from minus one to one, where one is perfect agreement, but generally around 0.6 and upwards is considered pretty good or substantial agreement actually. And if we compare what's been previously reported between human raters then, so average scores are in red. I mean, we see that it's about, it's over, 0 0.7 in, uh, for the MTA and the PA scale and slightly lower for the GCA scale, but it's still well within the range of what, or on par with what's been previously reported. And again, this, these numbers are probably a bit higher than if you were just take two radiologists that never met each other and you compare these ratings because they will have different, different rating schemes, uh, which might, may cause quite bad or quite low, low agreement. But still, this is, this is pretty good. We also did a qualitative check on some of the output that we get. Uh, and we treat this problem as a regression problem. So AVRA will output continuous scores, whereas the rating scales themselves are, is a discrete scale. Uh, so we picked a bunch of images that we rated differently or the same. So the top row here, represent images that the radiologist rated as a two in the first round. So this is from the test set. Uh, and the second row, she rated a three. And then each column is a different score given by, by our model. So first it's two and then all the way to 3.0 here. So we asked her to, well, look at these images again and just give her, give us her opinion, what she thought about it without knowing her previous scores or average scores. And, in fact, for the ones she rated a two, she would say that these first ones here, she would still consider them as an MTA, MTA of two. These ones here, she wasn't very sure. She would consider them some time, something of a border case. So if this was in the clinic, she would say, well, it's probably between a two and a three. But then for, this, for the research purposes, they have to settle on one score. And then these, she would actually rebrand as a, or re-rate as a three today. So that's good for our model. Uh, whereas the, the third row, she was very cons uh, determined that these were still threes. So looking more closely into these, why Avra fails or mispredicts these, 
uh, we found that there are actually somewhat of a corner case here. Uh, so these first two cases, the one with the most disagreement, there is a small what's called a hippocampal adhesion. So it's, it's stuck here. I don't know if it's visible for you. But um, so what she would do when rating a case like this is that she would mentally picture that, that she cuts this adhesion and then watches the uh, hippocampus shrink down a little bit. And then that mental image is what she rates. And I'm sure that the model would be able to handle this given enough data, but it obviously doesn't at this stage anyway. So it's, it's worth taking into account that uh, it doesn't uh, catch all these, um, well, less common cases. But, but either way, overall, it's pretty good performance, but it is then, if you want to implement something in the clinics, you would of course need to know how this perform in external data, particularly in clinical data. So this is then the second part of the study or the second study. So we know when working from with neuroimaging before that if you if we get data from two different places or two different cohorts using different scanners and potentially variations in scanning protocols is that we would not be able to just combine these without getting criticism from reviewers for sure. Uh, so this is I mean, a known issue in, in the field already. And it's also been studied for deep learning, when it's called the domain shift, that we typically do get worse performance when applying this into an external data set. Uh, somewhat of an issue is that deep learning models, they require very large data sets uh, to, um, to get good performance, which, and data is difficult to acquire. So, it makes sense to go to public research courts, but for instance, ADNI, which is the main one that we use for a lot of our research. I mean, even though it's acquired across 50 sites, they have gone through extensive harmonization of all their protocols. So they've been sending around uh, phantoms to get as equal, equal images as possible uh, across all sites. And further, they also have inclusion and exclusion criteria that may be excluding part of the population, which makes that these imaging cores are not very reflective of a clinical setting where you would have large variability potentially in your imaging and as well as a very heterogeneous disease population. So we wanted to do some sort of systematic study on the performance of a deep learning model. And in this case, we go to Avra uh, in out of distribution data. And further to add some novelty to it. We wanted to see how does it, is it affected by how the level of, or the degree of heterogeneity in the training data. So how much variability do we have in scanners and protocols and image quality? So the way to do this is to, by training multiple versions of Avra. And we just looked at the MTA for, for this one. Uh, so available to us, we had four different cohorts. So first ADNI, which was the biggest one. And it's, so it's an 80 cohort and very much of a research cohort. We have a Neuromed that we've never used Avron before. It's considered sort of as a European version of ADMI. Uh, so it hasn't gone through the same, like very extensive harmonization. So they haven't received their phantom or anything, uh, but it is similar. So they also use an Emperor H sequence in general. Uh, then we have the memory clinic data from, from Karolinska that we used in the previous project. So I'm just gonna plug in some power. Uh, so it's the same data we used in the, in the original project that we trained from, so memory clinic data. So it's also only, only Alzheimer's disease, but at least it's clinical data uh, with very, a bit more variability in the, uh, uh, in the sequences. And then probably the most important one is the data from the EDLB consortium. So it's a Lewy body dementia uh, European consortium where they've collected clinical images from 12 European sites. Uh, and this is a very heterogeneous disease population. So it contains DLB, it contains Alzheimer's disease cases, Parkinson's disease with dementia, um, and like no MRI protocol harmonization has been done whatsoever. So in total, this amounts to that we had roughly 3,000 images 
And I think what's sort of unique about this is that they were all rated by the same radiologist. Uh, so if we would have different radiologists given these ratings, that would be, have been a huge confounder and would have made it very difficult to interpret the actual results. So the way we did this is that we started with the whole training set for ADNI, uh, and we needed this, this training set because otherwise we couldn't get enough images because this was by, by far the biggest cohort. Uh, we then, when we wanna add additional data, we replace an image in ADNI with a subject from this database. So, and this subject should have the same label. And by doing this, we always keep N to 1568 subjects. And we also keep the label distribution fixed in order to try to reduce the, uh, I mean, any confounders that we can see that could affect the results. We trained five models, so the, the same as we did, we followed exactly the same uh, procedure as we did in the ori original papers. And this was done in order to try to, to avoid having going through like any hyperparameter tuning. Uh, so we use the same procedure. Then we compute the performance in the cohorts that were not used during training. And then we repeat this one more time, but with another combination of cohorts. All right, so, so this will be the main results. And you don't have to look at all of this because it's quite a lot, but essentially each co column represents a different training combination. So the first column, we only use ADNI. So it's only one check mark here. And then we evaluate the performance. And then in the second cohort, we also add, add neuromed data, which is another research cohort. And then we evaluate the performance like this. Uh, so it's sort of an increasing, the further right you go, the more uh, heterogeneity you have in the training data. So as a reference on the ADNI test set, when only training on ADNI, we get a kappa of uh, 0 0.67. And so what I want you to look at now is the, one, is the ones in color here. So ED will be test 50%. Uh, we just picked half of all the images from the EDLB consortium. So images from 12 different mem memory clinics. And if we just assess this with training on ADNI, so this will be uh, out of distribution data then completely, we'll get 0 0.59, which is definitely lower than, than for the ADNI. And to compare it when we add on data from the same institutions, but not the ones in the test set, of course, we get 0 0.65. So that would be the within distribution uh, performance. But what probably was the most interesting was the ones, the results that we had in red here. So this is C1 is what we call one specific center from this EDLB consortium. Uh, and from everything we could see, I mean, the images look very good. They use a single scanner and it's a 3D protocol, three Tesla, and no, from what I could see at least, uh, major artifacts or anything, they look fine. The same with center two, which are in blue. Also a 3D protocol, single scanner, and very good quality. But for some reason, Avra fails quite a lot to get very low performance in center one when we only train on ADNI. Uh, so 0 0.3 is considerably worse than, uh, than 0 0.67. And by adding at Neuroma data, which is then very, very similar to ADNI, we get 0 0.31, which is not a great improvement. Uh, and one, the only time we see an improvement is actually when we add memory clinic data, so from our own memory clinic. So it's still not the same data, but we get a pretty big bump up to 0 0.49, which is still a bit, a bit behind, but at least we're getting somewhere. And by adding more, more data from the other clinics in the Ruby Consortium, we at least managed to get it up to 0 0.52. But clearly these cases have not been represented in the training data when only using ADNI. So, uh, I mean, the performance will be, will be very bad in this, in this clinic if we try to implement something like Avra there. However, if we were to test Avra just on the uh, in center two, we would actually get a performance that was very close to, uh, to the ADNI test data. So 0 0.64 is kind of good and it doesn't improve that much when we add more data. Uh, so we looked a bit closer into this. So these plots we have on the x-axis is the prediction of um, when we only train on ADNI. And then on the y-axis is the prediction when we add on memory clinic data from Stockholm, as well as the data from the other centers in the EDLB consortium. 
And C1, for center C1 is the one on the left. And we can clearly see that there's a systematic difference. So when only using ADNI, we rate it too low. And when including more training data, we get, well, a very different, very different ratings, so much higher ratings. Um, but for C2, we don't see that. I'm sure there are some noise or some differences, but it's not very, it's not very clear in any direction or so. Uh, Gustav, I have a question. So how, mm -hmm. how many subjects are included in the C1 and the C2? How many subjects? Yeah. It was 101, I think, in C1 and then 160 in C2, if I remember correctly. So still quite a lot. Um, But what we conclude from the study was, I mean, overall, the performance drops when applied in external cohorts. And this is what's been seen before by previous studies as well, that we typically see a small drop uh, of performance. I mean, 0 0.6 would be considered kind of good in, in terms of visual ratings, I'd say. But what's interesting is that just that when we look at C1, it fails miserably. And that is a bit tricky. Uh, that is very difficult to say which ones will be bad and which ones will be good. Uh, so when you evaluate to see how well your deal model, deep learning model generalizes to new cohort, that could be an issue. I mean, either you, you're lucky or you're unlucky, however, however you want to see it. But on a more positive note, it seems that if you add more heterogeneous training data from more cohorts or more uh, with more variability, it looks like the models get more robust and generalizes better. And I didn't talk about it now, but we looked also to see if there were any overfitting to the 80 population. So if we see any better performance when only looking at the 80, but there doesn't seem to be any performance drops due to disease population. It's no, but it seems to be the uh, um, scanner protocol variation that, uh, that is the big thing. Does more heterogeneous data refer to more heterogeneous in terms of the, <clears throat> the brains that they represent, healthy versus pathology, or in terms of the protocols and the acquisition? Uh, what I'm referring to is the protocols. But I mean, I agree, though, that probably the, the performance of the models could probably go up if we had uh, because the label distribution is not, it's not even. So we have, we're lacking some zeros and we're lacking some fours, which are less, the less common ratings. Uh, so by increasing then, I mean, if you say that more heterogeneous disease population would probably give an even more even spread, that could probably help the performance as well. Because I think there's a, a little bit of issue that makes a performance drop in general of average that we don't, we have too few zeros and too few fours. But what I mean with heterogeneous here, it seems to be the, uh, or my take on it at least, is that it's the, um, the MRI protocols. And is there a drawback of having more heterogeneous data? Uh, we didn't see, I mean, we can go back to uh, these plots. I mean, you could say that ideally that ADNI test set would go down by, I mean, removing ADNI data and then introducing more heterogeneous data that doesn't, shouldn't help ADNI. And we see not that great of a difference. It seems pretty stable around 0.67. Uh, so as far as I can see, no. But uh, I guess it's, it's application dependent, maybe. Or it's difficult to say from the study. Have you tried the training without ADNI? Uh, no, because the uh, training set became very, would become very, very small then. Uh, right. I mean, I could potentially train on everything else and then apply it on ADNI. That, that yeah. could be a... I mean, I guess the question is what would be the rationale. I mean, so I, I, I guess you... So when you looked at the C1 uh, data, mm -hmm. it looked like uh, way better than the... Because the ADNI protocol is fairly old. So I guess uh, nowadays with 3T data and like, you know, advanced sequences, uh, are the, like, do the data look much better than the, than the ADNI one? Um, That's a good question. I, I don't know if I'm qualified to say. I, to me, it looked similar, at least. I couldn't see that there was a significant drop or anything in that there was more noise or that the uh, contrast between gray and white matter was, uh, was any worse in this protocol. But uh, 
I guess if you're more experienced, maybe you can have a better opinion on that. But for, from what all I can see is that it was a pretty good protocol. Uh, and I know that they've been, they've produced research on that data in, I mean, using neuroimaging software. So it's, it's been used for other software uh, usage purposes as well. Uh, you look at uh, other like technical, like potential technical differences, like coil differences, or uh... I mean, we we do have. I mean, every almost everything here is MPRH protocol, and I mean, it's difficult to say. Just looking at the scanning parameters, which ones would stand out in any way? I mean, they look well, very similar to everything else. Use, like if the if the coil, you know, if the antenna used is different, then you, it would result in a difference, like. Bias field. Yeah, that could be, uh, that's true. I don't know if this, yeah. Oh, that's a good point. One that I don't have information <laughs> regarding. But it's, that could definitely be it. Or oh, part of the explanation. And I mean, in this study, we didn't apply any heavy pre-processing, which should be, really be stressed here because bias field correction could potentially help in this sense it might i haven't tried it but uh it, it could alleviate some of these issues for sure but and, the fact uh, it, oh, sorry no but i mean it's and also the, this is just one model and we when we did the hyperparameter tuning it was still within within uh distribution data that we tried to evaluate it on so if we had had another goal initially that saying that okay well how well does this generalize to new cohorts and had that in our validation set then maybe we would overfit less to the protocol in some way or at least we could have tailored the data augmentation in a way that uh, that we may get better performance but there's a lot of different i mean the parameter space here to investigate is, is quite is kind of big so um but i am curious to see what's what's mainly driving this i mean if you look at the images they look visually different in terms of contrast i mean both look good as far as i can see but the c1 definitely has i don't know brighter brighter white matter from what I can see. Um, Have you looked into like uh, data augmentation strategies that would alter the contrast, uh, like nonlinear scaling or things like that? Uh, no. I mean, I've tried just briefly as a, as a toy project, but just adding uh, bias field correction, but uh, it, it didn't make a huge improvement as far as I remember, but this was in a pretty initial stage. So, uh, it is worth exploring more. I think there's a lot more work to be done. I think the data set is, is kind of unique because it's very big and visual ratings allows you to look at a lot of images. I mean, it has its issues in that it's just one label per image, whereas uh, a segmentation gives you a bit better, I mean, just more, more labels to predict, which gets you better statistics of uh, each individual image. But um, no, I, I definitely think there are ways to improve this and data augmentation techniques. And they're coming a lot of things out in just in, uh, in image processing, which, where they have these semi-supervised -supervised learning approaches where they essentially augment the data and then try to make them say that these should be consistent. The same data, same image should be produced consistent results. Uh, and that's not explored here, but it might have a, a positive impact. Or if you have any other opinions about this, I'd be happy to, uh, or any other take on this, I'd be happy to hear it. Or experience, for that matter. Um, Gustav, can I ask you a thing? Uh, mm -hmm. Before the training, did you do any transfer learning as a first step? No, I mean, we have tried this before. Or in the, when I did the first model, uh, I experimented with a lot of things, and including transfer learning, as well as, uh, I mean, different network architectures, but really I didn't see any difference. It didn't either, it didn't, it didn't even matter when, if I train a model for the, for the GCA, for instance, that scale, and then try to do the MTA scale, I mean, and use that as pre-training, it didn't, it didn't help either. So I think the limitation is really the, the rating var variability, because that's not perfect either. Uh, so it's not as consistent as one would hope. Uh, but they, but transfer learning did not give any improvement, as far as I can see. And I, 
didn't notice any difference when comparing uh, the random initialization of the weights with the initialization of the weights uh, with the, the layers from uh, trainer network on MRI data? Yes, I think there are some some differences, and I think it's related to um, so one of the issues here is also the discrete rating. So from, when I look at the, the output from these five models that we train uh, on each combination, we, I see that they tend to go to integers. So even the ones that we rate the 2.5 with the ensemble model, uh, it's typically that half of them go to two and half of them goes to three. So uh, it's difficult to disentangle whether it's I mean, I see the, the predictions or the ensemble predictions, which is really the original version as sort of a probability of an image being rated uh, with that score. Because if I guess get 2.6, then probably the radiologist would rate that image as a three, in three times out of five, and then a two, two times out of five. Um, but yeah, the, the definitely differences between the models, which then could be caused by um, different network initialization. But we are also different shuffling uh, patterns then as well, because I haven't, I, I use the same random seed for, uh, or same random seed for each set, which will affect both the network initialization and the, uh, and the shuffling in the mini batches. And since a lot of it's, uh, it's kind of a popular uh, application for deep learning. Uh, have you compared uh, your results with uh, other uh, other architectures? Or, uh, are they in line with those? Or? Uh, I mean, I've tried, I've compared it to, I mean, I've used VGG networks. I mean, even the simplest one did very good on, I mean, a really, really small VGG network did pretty good on the MTA scale. Um, but it typically failed on the GCA scale. So the, the cortical atrophy scale but um, the only i know that there's one other group or a company really that's has these for the mta scale that they try to predict the mta scale but they do it straight from from models i mean from volumes from, from volumetrics so the the traditional approach i presented earlier uh and i i think it has a lot of potential issues <laughs> um but, and I know I also did experiments with this free surfer output in the beginning and could, and I only could get um, kappas in the range of 0.6 or even below that at best. So this definitely is better than using free surfer data, for instance. So that kappa would be between the, ra the radar or? Uh... Uh, between, so on the test or on the validation sets uh, at that point, but um, from what we predict, and the radiologist, so the same radiologist, but on uh, a, a, a development set. And uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I'm curious what made you choose a, a so it's a 2D CNN and then it goes into the LSTM, right? Uh, yes. Okay, so I'm curious, like, what's the, the, the advantage or the difference between this and using a, a 3D CNN, since I guess your, your LSTM retains information from previous slices? Yes. Um, I don't yeah. know if you experimented with that or... I, I did. I've tried all. <laughs> uh, it, uh, so a 3D module, uh, model worked kind of well for MTA and the PA scales, but these were the ones I, that I got working pretty quickly and worked on a with a wide range of architectures. But the GCA scale was still very bad. Uh, the downside with using 3Ds, or the way that I saw it at least, I'm not sure if I think that anymore, but would be that it could be problematic. If you wanna apply the same architecture to a CT, CT scans, then it would not, it would be problematic because they typically stacked 2D images. Uh, probably a 3D, um, model would work as well but uh, but yeah uh, that was at least the main motivation but but anyway the i mean the network is very small now in the current because i think it has 1.5 million weights as opposed to yeah i don't know i know that the vgd that we compare it to in the in the paper it's 65 millions but i think yeah i guess it's 
it can be made smaller as well, but it, it's a small, small network. Okay. Uh, and, and, I, and I know that they've used it. I mean, I've seen uh, similar approaches in other studies as well with, uh, with good results. There was this uh, CT hemorrhage uh, competition on Kaggle, which and where I know that they also used a similar, I mean, fusing a CNN with, uh, with an RNN in the end. Uh, I have a question about uh, like um, the C1 center because it, it is not working. But did you apply like any transformation before testing it? Because you mentioned that that have augmentation for training, but did you apply something for testing as well? I no. I mean, we do some minor transformation just to know sort of where the uh, uh, where the brain is centered, so we can find so we're able to crop around approximately the correct area that we want to rate in. But no, I mean, I haven't looked into it further because I think, I don't know, we wanted to keep it sort of simple. And as soon as you start, I mean, there are a lot of different things to explore and I kind of want to explore them to see how can we get better performance in the center? I mean, what's, what's causing it? And is there a quick fix to this or semi-supervised learning techniques or anything else that can reduce this domain shift? Uh, because it could, could be as simple as if we've done a bias field correction, which works pretty much every time, then that would solve, solve it. I don't know. There are things to explore, left to explore. Yeah, that, that, that's like what, what I was thinking is that maybe there is too much like inter-center variability that you need to correct some way. And maybe like looking at the, at the different center would have you like brought like, I don't know, mean STD and stuff like that, the basic matrix or images. Yeah. No, no, I, I agree. It's, it's, it, it, I'm sure it's possible to get the performance, to get a better performance there. But I also think that like, if you're developing a deep learning model, you, will, you won't know this stuff, right? What would, you get a good performance in your within distribution data set, and you might even test it in an external cohort and you still get good performance. But it's difficult to say beforehand when it will fail in an, when introduced into a new clinic, for instance. And I think that's the message that we're trying to convey with this, but as you're right, I'm, I'm sure that there is ways of, there are ways of making this, this better and more stable, uh, but ways we did not know when we developed the model. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? We have one last question on the, Thinking of these four uh, radiologists uh, who had to uh, rate like uh, 3,000 in the scan. Uh, was, you, you might have mentioned that, but was there any like uh, intra radar uh, assessments? As far as uh, okay, so yeah, so the, the one radiologist that we used, I mean, in the first study we had access to, she's rate, she had rated about 260 of those images, she'd rated them more than once. And when we're looking at the, um, the inter-rater agreement, it was slightly higher for the MTA score. As far as I remember, I think it was about 0.79 and we got 0.72 to 0.74. Um, oh, 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 in, in Kappa? Yeah, uh, exactly. And then we, uh, but it was really bad, for instance, in the, for the GCA score, yeah, it was below 0 0.5, I, I remember that. But then again, I mean, if you look at the values that have been published, they're typically higher because I mean, they're not assessing whether their ratings are reliable or not. They're trying, just trying to, they have rated a set of images. Someone has done analysis on it. And then as an additional check to see that, okay, well, these ratings are reliable. They tend to re-rate a subset of those. And I mean, they should be good. Otherwise they would not report it typically. So I think there is a bias there. A, a small bias. That's my, that's my guess. But again, the, the point is not to, uh, for them, it's not to assess rating reliability. It's just to say that if we can replicate this, then it is reliable per se. So, um, yeah. But I think uh, yeah. it's, it's I mean, I get a question both on in terms of uh, like how you compare your the, your the performance of the semi-supervised approach with the uh, like hum, with humans, but it also raises potential concerns because you're also using those ground truths for training your model. Yeah. No, I agree, but I also, exactly, because so that's why it really, I mean, I was initially striving for the intra-rater, I mean, 
the, the, the variability she has within herself for her own ratings, that, that would be the, the upper goal. But yeah, it was impossible to get. So, uh, and I think that it, it is actually lower than what's been reported before. I don't think we're there just yet. I think there's room, some small room for improvement, but uh, it's really difficult to get those last yeah. few cases correct. And it was my experience at least. Uh, but I don't think it's 0 0.9 that should be the, that is the yeah. human level performance. I think it's pretty close to where we are, but. Yeah, we are, we are struggling with that as well for like <laughs> MS vision segmentation where we get like a interrater dice of like 0.6 or something, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know, I see a struggle. <laughs> Good, any more questions? All right, so thank you very much, Gustav. It was ah, very, thank very you. I'm very happy to, to come. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Atef, for organizing as well. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Good. All right. So uh, I guess good evening uh, on your end. Yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. I'll leave. Bye. Bye. Bye, Atef. Bye, Mathieu.